Um, thanks so much, Benito, and welcome back, everyone. Um, it's great to be together, and it's great to see all of you. And I'm going to go ahead and do the share screen and bring up my notes. And if you were here, if you were here for the class last week, you know, like, it's a lot. It's a lot. I'm, I'm trying to teach seven weeks of material in two one-hour sessions. Um, so, you know, I, I had my cup of espresso, and I think we're ready to go, ready to jump in and, and cover um, some detail here. Uh, Revelation is uh, 22 chapters long. Uh, the Greek title of the book is Apocalypsis, which the apocalypse, which is the Greek word for revelation. Um, we looked at a lot of this last week. Um, so last week, we covered chapters 1 through 5, 12, 13, and 17 through 19. So that was a lot. Um, and let me just go ahead and review a little bit of what we looked at last week, and then we'll jump into this week's session, what we're going to look at this week. So last week, the first five chapters are fairly straightforward. And, and I want to remind us also that our premise, um, as we look at the book, is the book really should make sense to the initial recipient and the initial readers, right? Like it was written for someone. Um, the visions were given to someone. Uh, they weren't give, given um, for, for us 2,000 years later. They were given to John 2,000 years ago, and he was to send this to the seven churches of Asia, which are mentioned in chapters 2 and 3. Um, the vision was for them, and, and it responded to their questions about their faith. So there are some amazing insights and lessons we can draw out of the book, but to take every vision in the book and assume that it must take place in our generation is not really what it was written for originally. And when we do that, actually, we, we kind of go down the same road that many previous generations have done, where they take the book and say, aha, it's this, it's this, it's this. And in fact, it's none of those things. So um, chapters one through five um, is all not vision, not future, not prophecy. Um, it's John exiled on the island of Patmos. Patmos is off the coast of Turkey. He was serving in ministry in Ephesus, which is in Turkey. Um, he was exiled because of the persecution. He refers to um, his fellow Christians as his brothers in suffering and his brothers in persecution. They're all undergoing this persecution, and he finds himself in exile. And he comes face to face with Jesus on the island of Patmos, and Jesus is going to give him seven letters to the seven churches. Um, we find those letters in chapters two and three. He writes down, it's kind of a report card for each church, where they're strong, where they're weak, and where they need to repent. And you can read that. It's fairly straightforward. It's non-prophetic. It's for those churches. John then is transported into the throne room of God in chapter four, and he sees God seated on the throne. He sees the angels. He sees the four beasts. He sees all kinds of incredible visions, the 24 elders, and he's in awe. And then he sees a scroll, and he wants to know what is written on the scroll, but no one is worthy to open it. And he says, so I wept and I wept, but an angel came to me and said, do not weep. Behold, the Lamb of God who is worthy to, uh, to open the scroll. Then he sees Jesus as a lamb that was slain in chapter 5, and Jesus will open the scroll. The scroll has seven seals, and that's one of the things that we're going to look at tonight. tonight. Then we looked at chapters 12 and 14, 12 through 14. Uh, 12 is um, Satan's failed ministries or Satan's failed missions. Um, he tries to stop Jesus uh, at, the, at the beginning of the, cha the chapter uh, and fails. Jesus is protected, and Jesus is taken back up to heaven. Um, then there is a war in heaven between Satan and his angels and Michael and his angels. And Satan is overpowered and cast down to the earth, and he fails in the war in heaven. And his new mission at the end of chapter 12 is to destroy the church, right? To make war against all those who, who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Um, and so now that's kind of the, the time frame we find ourselves in where Satan is at war against the church. That is his mission to destroy. Since he can't get Jesus and he can't beat God, it's to try to defeat God's people. Chapter 13, he has two 
allies in that mission. Of course, we looked at all this last week. So if this is, um, if you weren't here last week, we, we've looked at all this and we're not going to go over all of it again, but this is kind of just a recap. But he has two allies in the mission. He has, he stands on the, on the shore of the sea and he sees a beast come out of the sea. Uh, and the beast represents a foreign power, and he has many crowns and much power, um, and the, the beast is, has control over nations and peoples and language and multitudes. Um, and that's Rome, or the Roman emperor, rather. And then he views a beast that comes from the land or local. Um, so you've got the foreign beast from the sea, the local beast from the land. The local beast doesn't have power of his own, but he exercises power on the for, for the foreign beast. And he forces people to worship the foreign beast. Well, um, the local authorities, the governors and the governments of all the Roman provinces ruled by Rome's authority, not, not their own, and forced people to worship the Roman emperors actually as gods. And we talked extensively about that um, last week. Uh, we didn't do 14, so I'm just going to skip that next part. Um, chapter 17 through 20 uh, is the vision of. Um, the harlot and the beast, right? So the harlot sits on many waters. Um, it, her name is Babylon the Great. She's referred to, uh, she sits on seven hills, right? Rome is the city on seven hills. Um, and it, it says towards the end of the chapter um, that she is the great city that rules over all the nations of the world. Well, to anyone in the first century, in, in any of those churches in Turkey, reading that letter, there's no question that the harlot was Rome. What was the great city that rules over the whole world? It was Rome to them. Um, what was the city that was persecuting and oppression, oppressing the Christians? That was Rome. Um, so for them, the harlot is Rome. Babylon the Great is simply a name um, representative of a city or a nation or a power um, that oppresses God's people, right? In the Old Testament, Babylon was the oppressor uh, of Israel. Um, they, they destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple carried the people away into exile in the city of Babylon. Here, Babylon does not represent Babylon with not a power at that time, but rather is representative of the power persecuting God's people, which was Rome. Chapter 18, fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great, right? Her name is Babylon the Great. And then 18 is this, this um, amazing, like poetic um, uh, description of the fall of Babylon the Great. And it says that kings and merchants and sea captains will mourn, right? Kings ruled by her authority. Merchants grew rich by all her excesses. And sea captains transported all the goods to and from Rome, Babylon the Great. And they will mourn, but the saints, the apostles, and the prophets will rejoice because they have been oppressed by her. And in chapter 19 is a great battle. Actually, the battle is depicted in three different places. Um, chapter 14, it's Jesus and the wine press of God, right? Where the grapes are thrown into the wine press and they are crushed uh, by the wrath of God, of course, right? Um, my eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. That's where that verse from that song comes from. Um, and then in chapter 18, it's an angel who carries a great boulder and throws it into the heart of the sea and says, with such great violence, Babylon the Great will be thrown down in a single hour. She will be destroyed. Um, that's all from chapter 18, talking about the destruction of the oppressor of God's people, right? Their oppressor directly is Satan working through um, the Roman emperor, the city of Rome, and the local governors, right? So, um, and then the great battle. So the third description of God's judgment upon Rome is in Chapter 19, where we see this amazing vision of Jesus, right? Um, powerful and mighty. Um, written on his thigh is the inscription, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And he leads his people into battle against the beast and the false prophet and Satan and wins victory. The beast and false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire and Satan's in prison for a thousand years. So that's 17 through 20 A and all of that we looked at last week. And here's the Here's the graphic we looked at last week. This is the population of Rome. But somewhere between, I don't know how accurate this is, but somewhere between one and two million um, at the turn of the millennia um, and uh, easily the largest um, city in the world, the most powerful city and empire that the world had ever seen. Um, 
it went from a population of a million in a very short period of time to a population of about 20,000. And it stayed there. It stayed there for 1,500 years, where the only Rome was a backwater city, and the only thing there was the Vatican. Other than being the seat of the Roman Catholic Church, it was a nut, it was a small town. It was a backwater. It was the sticks. It was nothing. Uh, once it was destroyed, it was irrevocably destroyed, not to be resurrected for 1,500 years. So last week we saw the macro, right? We saw. Satan, we saw his allies, we saw the harlot, and we saw that it would be destroyed. The current state of affairs that the church is being persecuted by Satan, by Rome, by the authorities, um, and God will vindicate the concept that God will vindicate his people. Tonight, we're going to look at the micro. How is God going to do it, right? Now, we know what he's going to do. He's going to bring Rome down in a single hour and devastate it. How's he going to do it? That's what we're going to look at tonight. Um, so tonight we're going to look at everything you see in red, um, which means we're going to hit almost the entire book in two weeks. We're not going to hit chapter 7, 10, 11, and 14, which are really, really cool. And I'd love to, you know, love to have done, but just there's no way. We'll be lucky to get through all of tonight's. Uh, but we're going to hit um, the, the, the three different visions of seven, right? The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls of wrath. Um, which are going to describe how God is going to bring Rome to heal. Uh, and then in chapter 20, we're going to look at Satan's imprisonment, the final battle, judgment, and then heaven. Um, so let's jump in. The seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls. Okay, let me give you um, let me give you a spoiler, you know, spoiler alert. It's the same vision. It's the same vision from three different angles. Um, if I drive an hour from my house, I can be in Canmore, Alberta, in the heart of the mountains. And I can, you know, see a number of mountains. You can walk up to the top. Um, you can see the same mountain from different angles, and it looks very similar, but a little different. That's this. Um, this these three visions are the same. They're just different aspects represented. Why? Why would I say that? Well, they all have seven signs, right? Seven of each, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven bowls of wrath. They all have the same four, three format. They start out with kind of four, and then there's three that kind of vary off of those. And they all have virtually um, the same vision and same wording at the end, right? The seventh seal, there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightnings, and an earthquake. The seventh trumpet, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstone. The seventh bowl, and there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunders, and a severe earthquake. They all end almost exactly the same way. They come to this culmination at the end of the vision that are virtually identical with all three. Um, the trumpets and the bowls are nearly identical, right? Look at this. So the trumpets um, basically hail and fire on the earth, blazing mountain into the sea great star into the rivers and springs and the sun and moon and stars struck. Whereas the bowls is, are poured out onto the land, onto the sea, onto the rivers and springs and onto the sun. So identical, like identical. Um, and we, you know, we don't really get that necessarily because often when we read our Bible, we'll read, you know, we'll read several chapters a day. And so, you know, we'll read about the trumpets on Tuesday and then, you know, we'll read a whole bunch of other complicated, confusing stuff and our brain is firing in every direction, and then we'll get to the bowls like a week later, and we'll have kind of forgotten, and we won't realize that it's so similar. Chapter five, or rather, um, trumpet five is torturing of the worshipers of the beast, and and uh, the, the fifth bowl of wrath is the torture of the worshipers of the beast. Um, and then both have an invasion across the Euphrates River as the sixth sign. So now there's going to be different elements around them, and they're going to be somewhat different, but the similarities are, are obvious are obvious, and I think pretty clear. Um, how I kind of realized that they were, in my mind, the same vision is when I really lined them up side by each and just looked at them. And I have, I just put this on the screen for you to see it, but I did a cut and paste with the entire things. And then I just eliminated the things that were different. And what I came to realize was that there was so much crossover between them that it's hard to imagine that they're different visions. And you can see kind of, you know, the trumpets and seals 
between four and five, each is given power over a quarter of the earth or a third of the earth. And then uh, between uh, the, the trumpets and the bowls, uh, between five and six, power to inflict pain, but not to kill. And then, of course, identical endings. So it's going to make it a little easier if we don't have to come up with three different interpretations for seven different signs. Let's jump into the seals. Let me just try to keep an eye on the time here. Okay. I watched as the lamb opened the first of the seven seas. And I heard one of the living creatures say in a voice like thunder come. And I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. When the lamb opened the second seal. So remember, he's in the throne room of God. He saw the, he saw the scroll. The lamb came forward who's worthy of opening the, the, the seals on the scroll. And as he opens each seal, a new vision comes forward. So the first one is this white horse with a bow and a crown, a conqueror bent on conquest. The lamb opened the second seal and I saw a second living creature say, come. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come. I looked and there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hands. And I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, a quarter of wheat, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, three quarts of barley for a day's wage, and do not damage the oil or the wine. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth, fourth living creature say, come. And I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death and Hades was fallen close, close behind. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword famine, plague, and wild beasts of the earth. And so just a reminder, Hades, Hades is not hell. Hades is the realm of the dead. So all those who have died are awaiting the final judgment in Hades. Um, it's from a Greek term, and it's simply this realm where all the dead live. So the four horsemen, the first one represents war and external conquest, right? So a Conqueror bent on conquest, riding in on a white horse. Um, the second one is a the, the fiery red horse and rider who's given a sword and given the power to take peace from the earth, right? To remove or destroy um, the Pax Romanus, um, civil war or internal unrest. Um, so if one is a conqueror bent on conquest, external enemies, the other takes peace away from the earth, internal conflict, civil war, and unrest. The third is the scales and wants to sell you a quart of wheat for a day's wages or three quarts of barley for a day's wage is famine, scarcity, and hyperinflation. And I know hyperinflation sounds like something from modern monetary policy, um, and that's how we understand it, but it existed in a mind-blowing way in the Roman Republic. Um, and then the fourth, um, you know, the pale horse, uh, plague, disease, and death. All of these, all of these represented the downfall of the Roman Empire. If you look in almost any, in, any history book on the fall of Rome, they're gonna list these as the primary reasons. So let me go through them very quickly. The crisis of the third century was a period in which the Roman Empire nearly collapsed under the combined pressure of invasion, civil war, plague, and economic depression. That's from Wikipedia, so you can you know, kind of take that with whatever grains of salt you want. But um, that's in almost every single, and I, I've read about 10 books on the history of the Roman Empire, uh, including Gibbon's like most famous, kind of the granddaddy of Rome books. Um, the rise and fall of the Roman Empire. I've got it on my shelf here somewhere. And um, right here, it is a um, really, really good book. Um, the, probably one of the best books written on it, but it's an old book. It's written in the 1800s. Um, I don't really recommend you read it because it's really, really long, really, really wordy. Um, and, you know, 18th century, it's hard to read. 
Um, but it's great. It's, it's a great book. And you can read something more modern, um, something by Adrian Goldsworthy or someone like that, who's a little more easier to read and, 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 sh and less short-winded. Okay, let's talk about all four. War. Um, Rome itself had not been threatened since the second, the third century BC, right? So that was when Hannibal and Carthage invaded the Italian peninsula. Um, they were eventually beaten back and pushed out. And until the fourth century, really, no one threatened Rome. Rome had some defeats. When they went out to fight, um, they were defeated um, at one point by um, the, 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 um, uh, the Saxons in Northern England. They were defeated by the Germans in the Teuton Forest. They were defeated by the Parthians. So the Parthians would have been well known to the recipients of this letter. Right, the Parthians were in Eastern Turkey, Armenia, Iraq, and Iran. They were a powerful empire. They were mostly, as it turns out, cavalry. Right, they were they were horse-borne cavalry. Oftentimes, the riders and horses themselves would be fully armored, referred to as cataracts, uh, and they were experts with the bow and with firing their bow from horsebacks. They're the Parthians. Um, they inflicted a massive defeat on the on the Romans when Crassus tried to invade Parthia in 53 BC. There's a whole story behind it, the third tri this first triumvirate, etc. Uh, we can't get into that now, but he marched out as though he were Alexander the Great moving east, and he was killed, and virtually his entire invading force of three legions was completely wiped out by the Parthians. Um, they were east of the Euphrates River. Um, we're going to talk about the river systems in a minute. It's mentioned numerous times in Revelation, and it's important for the history of Rome. Um, and, and much worse is coming, right? So no one has gotten near Rome in hundreds of years. Um, the Parthians may have beaten them back. Um, the, German, the Germanic tribes beat them in, in 9 AD when they marched into, um, uh, into Germany, as we know it today. But but they're going to face problems within the empire soon enough. Civil unrest. Okay, so if the first force is foreign conquerors, the second is given a sword and the ability to take, to take peace from the earth. So the Pax Romana had existed from 50 BC to 200 AD. If you lived within the empire, you had safety and peace. I mean, you were under control of a foreign power. Um, and you didn't have your own freedoms and you were taxed, but you did have a certain amount of security and peace. Um, the emperors tended to reign for a long time. Um, there was peace within the provinces. Provinces didn't fall into civil war. They were kept under wraps fairly efficiently. There was not a lot of piracy or highway robbery. Um, and, and there was not a lot of internal like coup d'etats or rising up. Uh, this change in the second century between Rome and the provinces and also as far as imperial succession is concerned. So let me go ahead and read about, about the civil unrest. The crisis of the third, third century began with the assassination of Emperor Alexander's service at the hands of his own troop, initiating a 50 year period in which 20 to 25 claimants to the title of emperor, mostly prominent Roman army generals assumed the imperial power over all or part of the Rome of the empire. By 258 to 260, the empire split into three competing states with the Gallic empire, including the Roman provinces of Gaul, France, Britannia and Hispania, Spain, and the Palmarin empire, including the Eastern Providence, provinces of Syria, Palestina, and Egypt, right? So Egypt and Syria and Palestine and, and the Middle East becoming independent from the Italian-centered Roman Empire proper between them. The crisis ended with the ascension of Diocletian. Okay, Diocletian. In an attempt to end the chaos of the barracks emperors, Diocletian established an orderly succession process that divided the power and succession into two separate empires, the East and West halves. The East being the senior emperor, um, as of 286 AD, Diocletian as the Eastern Emperor was joined by Maxim um, in the West. Both emperors abdicated in 305 and Maximian was recalled in 306 by Galerius. 
In subsequent years, that succession rule was bitterly disputed by both the East and the West, and there were a total of 39 claimants to the imperial title between 305 and 474, and only five emperors ruled both East and West. So basically, after this period where, I mean, every year there was a new emperor, um, Diocletian decided what we're going to do is we're going to have a senior guy uh, and a junior guy. And actually, it's not written here, but beyond that, also in each the East and the West, we'll have um, an Augustus and a Caesar. And the Augustus will be in charge. And the Caesar will be under him. And that way, if the Augustus dies, the Caesar will simply assume power and will avoid all these you know, civil wars and these generals fighting each other and everyone trying to grab the crown. Um, of course, you can imagine this ended in complete disaster. What happened? Well, you know, the guys in the East and West both fought for control of the total empire. They weren't happy to have their sections. So they were at war with each other. And also they were constantly, the Augustuses were constantly keeping an eye on the Caesars who were under them. Why? Well, the Caesars wanted to assassinate them so they could rise up to power. Um, so the, the thought that this was going to bring peace to the empire um, was, I mean, like a lot of things, it was seemed like a good idea. It just really didn't work. Here's kind of a list of the Roman emperors. I'm not going to go through them, but just, just to take a quick look. So a lot of them we know, right? Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius, Nero, Caligula. Um, the three that we talked about last week, Galbo, Otho, and Vitellius, who served like six months each. Then Vespasian, Titus, Domitian, Trajan, Hadrian, right? And so that's those are all fairly well known. And they ruled for 150 years. So on average, like 20 years each. Um, then you've got some others that we know, Pius, Marcus Aurelius, right? We've heard of him because we've all seen the movie Gladiator. Um, you know, and Marcus Aurelius, just as background information, was a brilliant emperor and a philosopher and a writer and incredible, except he was a massive persecutor of the Christians. Um, so, you know, he had all those great things going for him and he seemed like a really good guy in the movie Gladiator. Uh, but he was a huge persecutor of the Christians. And then his son, Commodus. Uh, then there's a few others. And then we get to the 200s. And you see the change. Instead of reigning for 20 years, we're, we're getting a new emperor every two years. And it's constantly fighting. And the way someone became emperor, it wasn't, you know, someone, they would march with an army. And they would fight the current emperor. And so there was just this massive, continual civil war. So what started as a stable, steady, polit long, long lasting political entity turned into civil unrest and constant war, not external enemies at war, but internal enemies. Okay. Famine, uh, inflated prices, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. Okay, so you a quart of wheat makes basically a loaf of bread. Right? So imagine you make $50,000 a year. That's about um, $1,000 a week, 52 weeks a year. Um, so about $200 a day, which means that you go to your local grocery store and you buy a loaf of bread and that loaf of bread costs you $200. That's what, that's what the, um, the vision is saying, you know, a quarter of a day's wages for a quarter of wheat. Um, that's of course, unbelievable. If I have to pay $200 for a, for, for a loaf of bread or for you know three quarts of barley, that little bag of pot barley that I use to put in the soup when I make beef barley soup, that's gonna cost me $200. What is, what's a steak dinner with a bottle of wine at the keg gonna cost me for Helen and I? That's gonna cost me like $10,000. That was, so that's this, this, this vision, the third, the third seal is this inflated price, this hyperinflation, this scarcity, um, that things are like 10, 15, 20, 25 times their normal prices uh, and do not damage the oil or the wine. So wheat and barley are the essentials. They're what everybody needs to live. They're what the common man needs. Um, the rich are the ones that engage in oil and wine, the olive oil and the wine from the grapes. Uh, these were also the things that were produced locally, right? So I think we shared last week the whole idea of the sea captains, right? that they stopped growing wheat on the Italian peninsula. They stopped growing wheat in Greece uh, because of the vast demand from Rome for wine and olive oil. And so they grew the more expensive crops there. 
And so they had to bring in all their wheat from afar. They brought it in from the Nile River Delta in Egypt and from the Black Sea, and it was all transported in. And when, when um, the transportation system broke down, when the empire started breaking down, they could no longer get it. And so the prices went through the roof. Also typically invading armies would burn crops that could be replanted and regrown within a year, but would not burn crops that took many years to regrow and to plant and regrow, like grape vineyards, like olive trees. Why? Well, they would invade because they wanted to threaten them, take money, and then extract tribute for them year after year after year. So they could easily burn out the wheat knowing that they would regrow it the next year and they could pay tribute. But if they burned down the grape vineyards and the olive trees, it would take many years to grow back and they would not get them as tribute. Hyperinflation, the real crisis came after Caracalla um, in the period of intense civil war and foreign invasions. The emperor simply abandoned for all practical purposes silver coinage. By 268, there was only 0.5% silver in the denarius, which at one point was almost 100% silver. Prices in this period in most rose in most places and most parts of the empire, empire by nearly 1,000%. The only people getting paid were the barbarian troops hired by the emperors. The barbarians were so barbarous, they would only accept gold in payment for their services. And this is from an article, Inflation and the Fall of the Roman Empire. Of course, if you have questions about this, you can, um, you can ask any financial analyst like Dwayne Francis, and he'll explain this to you fully. Um, here we've got a graph of the, the silver content of the Roman denarius, which you see um, at the time that this was written would have been somewhere between 90 and 100% silver. Um, and it had now you know, de degenerated to somewhere around like two or 3% silver in an average silver coin. They were, um, they were copper and then coated with silver and the silver would quickly wear off. Plague, the fourth horseman is plague. Um, if you do a Google search, on the most devastating plagues of the, the history of the world. You will not find COVID-19 on that list. Although, you know, you think you might, right? You know, given all we're going through, uh, but you won't. But you will find three of the top seven are, are plagues that inflicted the Roman Empire. The Antonine Plague between 165 and 180. So after the writing of this book, probably 70, 80 years after this book was written, um, 5,000 deaths a day in Rome, decimated the Roman army, created enormous manpower shortages in agricultural areas, and killed one emperor, Claudius Gothicus. A um, hundred years later, the plague of Cyprian, 2,000 deaths a day in Rome, 5 million deaths in the empire, one third of the population in some areas, right? Not dissimilar to the, the Black Death or the bubonic plague that we know of from, from Middle Age um, Europe. Uh, one third of the population in many areas decimated the army and claimed two emperors, Lucius Verus and Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Not the original Marcus Aurelius, but a different Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. And that's two. The third would be the Justinian plague, which happened later after the fall of Rome in the Eastern Empire. But we see there, if you if those are the four horsemen, and if the horsemen are external enemies, internal conflicts, hyperinflation, scarcity, famine, and plague, um, every history book on the shelf of the library will tell you the downfall of the Roman Empire was caused by those four things. Then he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the, okay, that wraps the first four, number five. Um, he opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of those who'd been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they maintained. They called out in a loud voice, how long sovereign Lord, holy and true, till you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood. Then each was given a white robe. They were told to wait a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers were to be killed as they had was completed. Okay, we looked at this last week. This is the primary reason the book of Revelation was written. This is why John got the visions. It's a response to this question. The early Christians are being massively persecuted. Many of them have been killed. And this is the vision of those that have been killed crying out to God, saying, God, don't you see what's happening? Won't you do something about this? When will you do something? And they're told, "We, I see. Like, what does God say? I see it. And I will avenge your blood. But you have to wait. You have to wait. And it's, it's a theme. It's throughout the book. I can't 
you know, we talked last week about it a bit. There's a number, a number of verses that allude to it. Um, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity, he will go. If anyone is to die by the sword, by the sword, he will be slain. God says, I'm not going to fix it today, but I will fix it. Um, I watched, so the answer to the question now comes, I watched as he opened the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake, the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair, the whole moon turned red and the stars in the sky fell to the earth as a late fig drops from the tree when shaken by a strong wind. <laughs> great image there. I don't know if we get that image because we don't have a lot of fig trees around our homes, but, but you know, we get that image, it falls to the ground. The sky receded like a scroll rolling up and every mountain and island was removed from its place. And the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they cried to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for great, for the great day of their wrath has come and who can stand it. And this is the response to the previous question. How long until you avenge us? And this is kind of the, here it comes. Here's the sixth seal. Here's the, here's the revenge. And everyone on earth will hide and cry out and, and say, you know, save us from the wrath of the lamb. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for half an hour. Then I saw seven angels who stand before God and they were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and hurled it to the earth. There came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning and a great earthquakes. Okay, so that's kind of the end, like that's the wrap at the end, right? We saw that, that each one of these series of signs is going to end with that. And so that's, that's the wrap. Um, so here we see like this cataclysmic event with the mountains being removed, the islands being removed, the earthquake, the peals of thunder, everyone on earth, great and small alike, from slave to king, crying out, save us from the wrath of the lamb. And then he introduces the next set of, uh, of, of signs, the next set of visions, which are the seven trumpets. Okay, so the souls under the altar are the Christian marchers. They've been killed for the word of God and their testimony, their question is how long how long until you avenge us and the answer is you have to wait a little while until more martyrs are added to your to your number um okay the earthquake is is a um just a symbol of god's judgment or a judgment not the final judgment jesus coming back books being opened etc but a judgment of god upon a nation much like he judged nineveh and assyria much like he judged babylon in the old testament his judgment over Rome. Um, and then there's silence and the trumpets are revealed. And then that familiar ending that we're going to see in all three sets of signs. Okay, let's continue. We got lots more to go. So let me take a big breath. Okay. Um, the first angel sounded his trumpet and there came hail mixed with fire and blood. And it was hurled upon the earth and a third of the earth was burned and a third of the trees were burned and a third of the grass was burned. The second angel sounded his trumpet, something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned to blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. A third trumpet sounded his angels, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky. Okay, you kind of get where this is going, right? These are all these signs falling upon the earth, right? One on the land, one in the sea, one on all the fresh water, and one is going to be the sun and the stars. So if you cover the heavens above you and all the salt water and all the fresh water and all the land, what's left? That's everything, right? There's nothing else to add to that. That's everything. You look up and everything is affected. You look on the ground and it's affected. You look in the waters, whether oceanic or, or fresh water, it's all affected. The idea that this is coming and nothing or no one will escape and it will be cataclysmic. Um, they're all non-specific judgments, right? So the four horsemen were specific. They described events. They described things that were coming. These are non-specific. Simply the fact that, you know, something drastic, 
something dramatic, something horrific is coming and is going to affect all of this. Um, it's kind of general apocalyptic language, right? Like the moon turning to blood and all this. This is all we see this throughout. And, and I think we talked about this last week, but we read this and say, this is so confusing. It's so bizarre. It's so weird. Who writes like this? But this was a common form of literature from 200 BC to 200 AD um, in the Jewish world. They used apocalyptic literature all the time. And it was common and the recipients would recognize this. And John the apostle, when he saw it, would recognize what he was receiving. Uh, many of these are similar to the Old Testament. Um, you know, the, the, some of them are similar. Some of these are similar to the plagues of Egypt. Um, within that, we didn't read all of it, but there's the hail, there's water turning to blood, there's darkness coming over the whole land. Those are three of the plagues of Egypt. There's an allusion to wormwood and bitter waters. You can kind of figure that out. It's from Deuteronomy and Jeremiah and Amos. So the first four are generic. The fifth is going to be much more specific. And I watched and I heard an angel that was flying in midair call out in a loud voice, whoa, 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 to the inhabitants of the earth, because the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the three other angels. The fifth angel sounded his trumpet and I saw a star that had fallen from the sky to the earth. The star was given a key to the shaft of the abyss. When he opened the abyss, smoke rose from it like the smoke from a gigantic furnace. The sun and the sky were darkened and this, uh, by the smoke from the abyss. And out of the smoke, locusts came out upon the earth and were given power like that of scorpions of the earth. They were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people who did not have the seal of God on their forehead. They were not given power to kill them, but only torture them for five months. And the agony they suffered was like the sting of a scorpion when it strikes a man. During those days, men will seek death, but not find it. They will long to die, but death will elude them. The locusts look like horses prepared for battle. On their heads, they wore something like crowns of gold and their faces resembled human faces. Their hair was like woman's hair. Their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings was like the thundering of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. They had tails, um, they had tails and stings like scorpions and in their tails, they had the power to torment people for five months. They had a king over them, the angel of the abyss, whose name in Hebrew was Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon, which means destroyer. Uh, the first woe was past, the other two are yet to come. So remember, it started with the angel saying, whoa, 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 for the next three trumpets that are about to be sounded. This is the first one. So kind of similar to Joel, if you read the first couple chapters of Joel, he describes a plague of locusts coming from the north on Israel. But then when he describes the locusts, they sound a lot more like soldiers. And um, so it, to me, that sounds a lot like he's using an image of locusts, just this horde that covers the landscape that is an unimaginable number. Um, and it is, but it's actually a foreign army that is invading. Uh, and in, in the prophet Joel, I think it's referring to the Assyrians invading from the north and carrying away um, the northern tribes of Israel in 722 B.C., so you can go ahead and read that. It's very interesting in the book of Joel. Um, similar to Joel, the, horse, the, the, the locusts um, sound like horses and chariots and have armor and look like people. So um, soldiers invading armies. The abyss is the bottomless pit um, or a pit of immeasurable death. Uh, depth. Um, it's, we recognize it from the story of Legion in Luke chapter 8. Remember Legion, right? Jesus asks the, the demon-possessed man, what is... He asked the demon in him, what is your name? And he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And, and Jesus is going to drive him out. And he begs Jesus, don't send me to the abyss. The abyss was this place of imprisonment for evil spirits where they would be imprisoned. And you kind of get that sense, right? We open the door and out comes, right? And so it was a place of imprisonment for evil spirits. Again, it's kind of, it's, it's, it's Greek word and it's, it represents something in the Greek language and also in, in the Christian and Hebrew religion. Okay, they're given power to torture but not kill. In other words, the destruction won't lead to utter death and, and finality. And God's people would be protected, right? So when they attack, they're told you, you, can, you can torture, not kill. And you also can't touch 
right? The grass, the trees, you know, all these things that they're not allowed to touch, including all those who have the mark of God, right? So that's from chapter seven, which we're not going to look at, but the 144,000, it says that he sees the 144,000, the four angels, which are probably the four horsemen, are, are delayed at the four corners of the earth while an angel comes to seal the 144,000 servants of God, that they receive a mark on their foreheads, which is their seal. And it says here that when this invasion takes place, that they, can, they cannot harm the land and they cannot harm those who have the mark of God. Okay, this is absolutely incredible because the first time Rome is destroyed, that it's attacked and sacked, is in 410 AD by Alaric the Goth. They invade Rome, and the Christians are not touched during the invasion. In other words, the Christians are protected from the invading army. The army rolls through the city, burning, looting, raping, killing, pillaging, and yet, and yet, anyone who had taken refuge within a Christian church was spared. And I say that, and I'm like, you must be like, come on, that's ridiculous. It's a historical fact. Augustine wrote this in his book, The City of God. There are histories of numberless wars, both before the building of Rome and since, since its rise, and the extension of its dominion. Let these be read, and let one instance be cited in which, when a city had been taken by foreigners, the victor spared those who had been found to fled to the sanctuary of the temple of their gods. Or one instance where a barbarian general gave orders that none should be put to the sword who had been found in this or that temple. Basically, Alaric the Goth commanded his generals, commanded his leaders to lead his troops in the invasion and that they were not to touch the churches they were not to loot anything in the churches. They were not to touch any of the people in the churches. See, the Goths had been evangelized by the Christians, and they were um, a, a form of, of Christian. Now, obviously, if they're rolling through the city, burning, killing, looting, and raping, they're, they're not really great Christians. But the, the, there was a certain respect for Christ and for God, and they refused to touch all of those who'd fled to the churches. The Visigoth sacking had, become, had been relatively controlled. Many of Rome's most famous monuments and buildings were left untouched. And since the Goths were Christians, they allowed people to take refuge inside the basilicas of St. Peter and St. Paul. Nevertheless, news of the eternal city had fallen sent shockwaves across the Mediterranean. My voice sticks in my throat as, and as I dictate, sobs choke me, wrote the Christian St. Jerome. The city which has taken the whole world was itself taken. St. Jerome is an early Christian writer. Um, we recognize him as probably the first person to translate the Bible into Latin. And this is what he read or what he wrote at the fall of Rome. But um, from this uh, his, the history channel um, on the sack of Rome, the fact that if you were in a church, you were spared. Those who seal, were sealed by the mark of God would be spared. John saw this in 90 AD. Rome was sacked 300 years later. It's phenomenal. The six angels sounded the trumpet, and I heard the voice from the horns of the golden altar that is before God. And it said to the six angels who had the trumpet, release the four angels that are bound by the great river Euphrates. Then the four angels have been kept ready for this hour and day and month and year were released to kill a third of mankind. The number of mounted troops was 200 million. I heard their number. The horses and riders I saw in my vision looked like this. Their breastplates were fiery red, dark blue, and yellow sulfur. Their head, the heads of their horses resembled the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and sulfur. A third of mankind was killed by the three plagues, etc. cetera. Uh, the rest of mankind that were not killed still did not repent of the work of their hands and did not stop worshiping demons, idols of gold, silver, bronze, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk. Uh, nor did they repent of their murders, magic art, sexual morality, or their baths. Okay, so another army, another army to be released over the river Euphrates. The four angels, maybe the four horsemen from chapter six, uh, maybe the four angels from chapter seven, those all may be the same or different. It's hard to know. 200 million is not an actual number, should not be taken as such. Um, 
an ancient army, Attila the Hun's army was, was reputed to be 500,000 soldiers, which was unimaginably large, um, an incredibly large army for ancient times. Many dispute that it was actually that large. 200 million would be an impossible number, but simply used to let us know that it's a huge, astounding, overwhelmingly large and terrifying army. Across the river Euphrates, okay, let me talk a bit about Rome and the river system. Uh, Euphrates was the eastern border of the emperor. Um, the Parthians were on the other side. The, the Sassanid Persians were on the other side. Uh, Roman, the Romans contained them on the other side by a series of forts along the river Euphrates. If they came and tried to cross the river, the Romans would promptly attack them. They used the river, river for protection. Not just the Euphrates, also the Danube and the Rhine. So all the Germanic tribes were on the other side of the Rhine and the Goths, the Huns, and a number of other, the Alans, a number of other tribes were on the other side of the, Euph uh, of the, uh, of the Danube. So these three rivers, along with the oceans, of course, on the other side of the empire, kept all of their enemies outside. Um, any enemy who wanted to attack within had to cross a river. Um, also, the, 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 this river, the, the Euphrates, will be mentioned in the sixth bowl of, ra of wrath. Okay. The dates for the fall of the Roman Empire. There are two armies mentioned here by the fifth and sixth trumpets. Uh, both are large and both are coming after Rome. Uh, some of the more significant dates, we'll look at this in just a minute, but in 406 AD, the Germanic tribes, which had been kept at bay um, for hundreds of years, surged over the Rhine River um, all at the same time and basically rolled through the empire. Um, they had been kept on the other side for hundreds of years, four, five, six hundred years, but they all at the same time came over and, and invaded France, Spain, Northern Italy, all the way to England. Uh, and they captured the entire uh, Western segment of the Roman Empire. Alaric the Goth, as we talked about a minute ago, sacked Rome in 410 AD. In 452, Attila the Hun invaded Italy and marched to the gates of Rome where he was bought off. And so he did not attack and sack the city and left. But three years later, a Gesseric the Vandal um, attacked the peninsula and he did take Rome, and by 455, that was the end. So remember the first army, it says that they were given the power to torture but not kill. Um, Rome recovered, right? Rome recovered from the Gothic invasion in 410, but 455, once the Vandals took it, that was it. They survived under Germanic um, Odasser and other Germanic rulers for about 20 years, and after that, they were done pretty much forever. Here's, here's just an interesting map of kind of the pre-invasion, right? And if you, look, if you look in Germany, what you can see is all these Germanic tribes that have been contained east of the Rhine River for like hundreds of years. So the Saxons and the Angles, well, where do they end up, right? We, we recognize those names right away, the Anglo-Saxons, right? Both of those tribes end up in England. The Franks, right? The Franks became the dominant power in Gaul, right? France. Um, they overwhelmed the Gauls and became the dominant tribe over all of France. The Suevis end up in Spain and are a province of Spain. The Burgundians, Germanic tribe. If you know France, you know there's a, or if you know red wine, you know that there is a province in France called Burgundy. Um, the Lombards, there's a province in Northern Italy called Lombardy. Um, and you can kind of go through all of these tribes end up as provinces or, or somewhere in Western Europe, they overwhelm all of the Western empire. And then um, in the center, like in the Hungary, Romania, and these areas, you've got the Goths and other nations. Okay, so what's gonna happen is in 405 AD, the Rhine freezes over and all of these Germanic tribes surge over. The Goths are kept on the other side of the Danube. Now they are being pressed by the Huns and they're caught between the Roman empire on one side and the Huns in the other. So they request to be allowed to come into the Roman empire 
um, for protection. And the Romans they view them as great soldiers, and so they want to use them in their army. So they actually bring them across the river and settle them within the empire. But then they mistreat them horribly, and the Goths revolt. You can read all about this in this incredible battle at Adrianople. The Goths revolt. The Romans have to fight them within the empire. They, they corner them at Adrianople, thinking they'll destroy them. But in fact, it's the Romans that are destroyed. Now the Gothics, the Goths become these incredible power just, just uh, east of Rome. And eventually in 410, um, they sack the city. Also, you see the Vandals on the other side of the Danube here. This idea of the river system, right? Bound by the river Euphrates. Once these armies get over the rivers, um, they are free to wreak havoc on Rome. And here's another, here's kind of where they all end up, right? The Visigoths, the Burgundies, the Lombards, the Ostrogoths, the Franks, the Alemannis, uh, the Anglo-Saxons all end up in Western Europe. Okay, the seventh trumpet is anticlimactic, but you're gonna see the end. Um, if you look at the bottom paragraph, then God's temple in heaven was opened. And within the temple was seen the Ark of his covenant There came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunder, and an earthquake and a great hole, um, hail storm. So uh, five and six, two massive armies bent on bringing, uh, bringing an end to the oppressors of, the, um, of God's people. So seven seal is anticlimactic. Okay, let's keep going for another few minutes. As I looked, I saw in heaven, the temple, that is the tabernacle of the testimony was opened. Out of the temple came seven angels with seven plagues, the bulls of wrath. Um, they were dressed in clean shining linen, wore, uh, wore golden sashes around their chests. When one of the four living creatures gave the seven angels seven uh, golden bulls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, go pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Okay, so the first four are the same as um, the trumpets, right? Um, the land, the sea, the rivers and streams, uh, and the sun. All referring to these cataclysmic events, but non-specific. Um, the reason they are poured out um, when, th when the third angel pours out his bowl, um, one of the angels says, you are just in these judgments, you who were, you who are and who were the Holy One, because you have so judged for they have shed the blood of your saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink as they deserve. So the, the, all of this, all of these judgments are retribution, retribution for the persecution and the oppression that Rome has bestowed upon the, the early Christians. The fifth angel um, is gonna be poured out on the throne of the beast and his kingdom is plunged into darkness. Men nod their tongues in agony and curse the God of heaven because of their pains and sores, but they refuse to repent, right? So much like um, the fifth trumpet, right? They were tortured, but they did not die. Um, they cried out in pain, they gnawed their tongues, they're in agony, and yet did not die. The city, the city suffered enormously, but actually didn't die and came back. Um, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the river Euphrates, and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. I saw three evil spirits that looked like frogs. They came out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. They are, they are spirits of demons performing miraculous signs. And they go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them uh, for battle in the great day of God Almighty. Okay, so I don't know what the frogs are. Um, it's a little confusing, but um, we looked at the last series and this massive army was bound by the river Euphrates and came across. And here we see this idea of the river Euphrates is dried up. Right, so the fifth bowl, similar to the fifth trumpet, torture and agony, but not death. The sixth bull leads to the great battle across the Euphrates River, all the kings of the world, Armageddon, right? Armageddon is actually the name of a location. We think of it as this cataclysmic global thermonuclear war between um, the, you know, the communists and, and the capitalists, um, at least we used to when there were communists, but 
Um, you know, we, we view it like that, but it's actually a location in Israel, Mount Megiddo. If you read the story, there's a great battle that takes place there between the Egyptians and the Israelites, and Josiah the king, I believe, is killed there. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice saying, it is done. There came flashes of lightning, rumbles, peals of thunders, and a severe earthquake. No earthquake like it has ever occurred since man has been on the earth, so tremendous was the quake. The great city split in three parts and the cities of the nations collapsed. God remembered Babylon the Great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away and the mountains could not be found. From the sky, huge hailstones, about a hundred pounds each fell upon men. They cursed God on account of the plague of the hail because the plague was so terrible. So there's a lot of bleed over between here, right? Same wording as the seals and trumpets. The islands and mountains being removed or the mountains fleeing and or the islands fleeing and the mountains not being found is the same as the seventh seal. But also the idea of the great city being thrown down is from 17 and 18 that we looked at last week, which interconnects the specific with the macro. Um, Babylon the Great, right? We understand the angel crying out, fallen is Babylon the Great in chapter 14. But then also the harlot whose name is Babylon the Great and fallen is Babylon the Great from 17 and 18. And the idea of drinking from your own cup was something that it said the harlot would be given to drink from her own cup. In other words, since she oppressed others, she would be forced to endure the same oppression. Okay, give me five more minutes and I'll, and I'll wrap it up. Um, we talked last week a bit about this final, you know, Jesus, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, mighty conqueror, right? And he rides forth. And so this is the third depiction of this battle and he rides forth with his army and i saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered to make war on the rider of the horse right jesus and his army the beast was captured with him the false prophet who performed the miraculous signs with these signs he deluded those who received the mark of the beast and worshiped his image the two were thrown into the fiery lake of sulfur the rest were killed with the sword okay so you know, the two beasts at the end of this battle are thrown into the fiery lake of sulfur, which is referred to later in the book as the second death. That's the end of Rome. It's the end of the empire, right? All the, the second beast, all the provincial authorities are thrown down. The emperor himself is done. And the city, the harlot, is also thrown down. Then I saw an angel coming down out of heaven, right? In the same breath, right? having the key to the abyss and holding in his hand a great chain. He seized the dragon, that ancient serpent, who is the devil or Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. He threw him into the, into the abyss and locked and sealed it over him to keep him from deceiving the nations anymore until a thousand years were ended. Until then, uh, after that, he will be set free for a little while. So every time period in the book of Revelation up until now has been short, right? Three and a half years, three and a half days, 1260 days, 42 months, it's all been short. Now you get a thousand years, right? A thousand years symbolizing this long period of time. Now that the, the Rome is gone, the emperor is gone, the empire is gone, the authorities are gone. Um, Satan is imprisoned, not dead, not gone, not just, but imprisoned with the great chain in the abyss. We see this, this is from Legion in Luke chapter 8. Um, we see also the abyss in Jude, angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains until judgment on the great day, right? There's this idea of the imprisonment of evil spiritual beings until the final day of judgment. Just like all of the dead of mankind are waiting in Hades, the abode, right? The abode of the dead, either on the Paradiso side waiting resurrection to eternal life or in the tartarus side um awaiting being cast into the lake of fire which is the second death at which point their lives will be snuffed out for all eternity um so angels are held in darkness with everlasting chains much like satan in the abyss um bound by a large chain for if god did not spare angels second peter 2 when they sinned but sent them to Hell, terrible translation, Tartarus, right? It should be, not Gehenna. Gehenna's hell. This is Tartarus in the Greek. Putting them in chains of darkness and held for judgment. Satan is imprisoned 
just like all these angels are in prison awaiting the return of Jesus and the days and the day of judgment. Satan is imprisoned, right? After all of this, after his failed war on the early church, and after God judges the enemies of the early church, Satan is imprisoned for a thousand years in the abyss to be kept from deceiving the nations. Eventually, he'll be released. I'm just going to summarize this. You'll have to read it. He'll be released. There'll be this uprising. Um, God will intervene, and then Jesus will return. Um, there's something in there about those who were beheaded for the sake of Christ being raised with him and seated on thrones. Um, the concept of this kind of resurrection of the early martyrs that perhaps they are reigning with Christ awaiting, awaiting his return in, at which time. So what happens when he returns? When he returns, Satan is released. He takes Satan, right, is released from the abyss, released from the chain. He takes him, casts him into the lake of fire. That's the end of Satan. All the dead are raised. There'll be a battle. Then all the dead are raised. The righteous are resurrected to eternal life into heaven. And uh, the wicked, or those who are not with Christ, are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. It mentions the beasts and Satan suffering forever and ever in the lake of fire. It does not mention any person suffering forever and ever in the lake of fire. I would suggest that the lake of fire for humanity is simply the end of existence, um, the second death, uh, rather than um, eternal life. Uh, but the righteous are raised to eternal life in heaven. <sighs> Satan's released for a short time, deceives the nation, great battle. Satan and his followers will be destroyed. All the dead are raised and judged according to the books of life. And then you see heaven come down and we spend eternity with God. And all that is um, chapter 21 and 22 without looking at a single verse. Um, because we're way, way, way over time. But uh, you, you can get that. The whole idea is that the first five chapters are John's era. Um, chapter six through chapter, the second half, the, the first half of chapter 20 is the destruction of Rome. And then the second half of 20 to the end is the future date when Christ returns, finishes Satan, and resurrects the Christians, the dead and alive Christians to eternal life and cast all the, all the rest into the eternal fire. And I'm really sorry, that was really, really, it's a lot of information, it was really fast, and I would have liked to do more at the end, but you know, we just were way out of time. So I'm gonna give it back to Danny. Question, because I, I mean, I read, so what helped me is I read the book of Revelation like five or six times and was thoroughly confused. And I read a number of history books on the history of the Roman empire, and I started to piece things together. And then, of course, I have a whole bunch of, of reference books. So you can get um, like one of many reference books. But, you know, they're really, really wordy. Um, and, you know, they're reference books. You, you don't just sit down and read them. What you'll do is you'll, you'll look for verses that maybe you don't quite get or you don't understand that you find a little complicated. And see what the reference book says. Um, but yeah, there, you know what? There's not a, a reference book that I found to be, wow, that's so simple and easy and it really filled in the blanks for me. Like all of those were after reading the book, after piecing together what I thought I got, after reading Roman history, after going back to the book, and then anything that I couldn't quite figure out, like chapter 11, the two witnesses, I'm not really sure what the two witnesses mean. I have some ideas now, but, you know, guys, I've read Revelation 30 times through. Um, and, you know, I've read tons of stuff around it. So I would just say, read a little bit of Roman history, read, read Revelation, figure out which parts you think you really get and kind of nail them down and then piece more and more on top of it. And I just find the more I read it, the more things become clear to me. Um, but I don't really have one simple you know, book that I would recommend. Honestly, a lot of the books that I read, I found more confusing than helpful. That's hell. Um, but no one goes to hell until Jesus comes back at the final resurrection. 
right? The second coming, the dead are raised. And it says death and Hades give up their dead. Everyone who has died is waiting for Christ to come back in Hades. Hades is from, you know, the Greek word Hades. Um, that means the realm of the dead. It's where everyone who's died is right now. And if I, if I die tonight um, and Jesus doesn't, you know, come back tonight, then I will go into Hades and that's where I will wait. Now, it seems like there's two sections of Hades. The Hades for the wicked, Tartarus, where evil angels are imprisoned um, and where the unrighteous go, Second Peter, um, those who disobeyed long ago, Jesus preached to them after um, he was raised. So that's, um, that's one section. And also where if you think about Lazarus and the rich man, clearly they were in different places and they were still conscious and they could see each other, but there was a separation between them. So Tartarus is where the wicked are awaiting judgment and Paradiso, paradise is a section of Hades where the righteous are awaiting judgment. Right, Jesus tells the thief on the cross today, "You'll you'll be with me in paradise, paradiso." So anyway, I don't. That's a, probably an oversimplistic way of understanding it, but it's almost as though everyone who dies is in Hades. There's two rooms in Hades, that's better, that's better, that's better. one for the wicked, one for the righteous. And when Jesus comes back at the final, at the second coming, when he raises up all the dead for the final resurrection, then Hades and death gives up the dead. Everyone comes up before Jesus. The unrighteous are cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death, ultimate destruction. I, I think some believe that it's eternal suffering. I, I really have a hard time with that. Um, and but those that are in paradiso, those that have lived for God or lived for Christ, um, are resurrected, transformed, and then heaven comes and spend eternity with God. 